Hi everyone, my name is Jay, and I'm going to talk to you today about figure preparation ethics, also known as how not to get your paper retracted. Um, this is intended to be the first part in a multi-part series on how to prepare scientific figures in Adobe Illustrator. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the motivation for um, doing that. Um, firstly, I'm going to start talking about ethics and contrast adjustment. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about image scaling and then um, kind of why we prefer Adobe Illustrator um, for uh, good figure preparation over PowerPoint or Photoshop. I'm going to talk very briefly at the end about um, image resolution and DPI, and Sarah Smith will do more presentation on that in the future series. Um, so the purpose of most of our microscopy image measurements and um, gel imaging measurements and whatnot is usually to measure intensity. We want to know how bright a band in a gel is or how dark a band in a gel is or how bright a, a, you know, a cell is in a sample. And the problem is that microscopes and cameras don't measure intensity. They actually measure the intensity multiplied by some detection efficiency um, and then added with some offset. And microscopes, most modern microscopes, can measure intensity on a scale of 0 to 65,000. Um, but your eye can't resolve that much detail. Um, viewing and computer software and screens demands 256 intensity levels at the most to visualize things. So the result is that the software has to decide what the minimum and maximum intensity is of each image that gets displayed. Um, and some software can emphasize high intensity more than other intensities or low intensity more. That's something called gamma adjustment, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so a good way to think about um, intensity measurement in the way microscopes measure it is the intensity histogram. So if you look at this image here, this is an image of a neuron. It's one of the sample images from Fiji. Um, you can see that most of the pixels in this image are actually black. Um, a few pixels are bright red. So this is the intensity histogram, and each bar is how many times each intensity is observed, plotted on a log scale so you can see the, the um, low frequency intensities. And you can see the most common pixel intensity in this image is around 1,000 intensity units. And that is our background. That's what we call black in this image. This is what we call red in this image. Okay, and very, very few pixels have those red intensities. And we typically decide to show um, the, the color or the, the brightness of an image as a linear distribution between the minimum intensity in the image and the maximum intensity image. So up here we have red and down here we have black. Um, but the way we show the brightness of an image is going to depend on what we're trying to say about that image scientifically. The appropriate levels depend on application. Let's say we said something like punctate dendritic intensity levels are stronger than cell body localization. Well, in that case, we need to show in this image that this little puncta is significantly brighter than everything else in the image and the cell body itself. Instead, what if we're talking about morphology? We want to show people that there's six dendrites protecting from this cell body. This image is not the way to show morphology. It's not going to work. Okay, so we have to boost the contrast. We have to do something called saturation. Here you can see this line represents the intensity range in our image. And you can see we stopped red here in this image is short, dramatically short of the maximum intensity in the image, which was 8,500. So everything from 1,870 intensity units up to 8,500 intensity units, this is just all red. But we can see the morphology of the neurites, or the dendrites, sorry, in this image. Um, what about localization? Protein is present a lot at punctate spots along the dendrite as well as diffuse localization along the dendrite. You can't see this in either of these other images. Here, the, the intensity looks uniform along the dendrite. Here, you can't even see the dendrites. So we have to show an intermediate contrast. And this is the typical contrast that most people would show for images. Okay, and it's appropriate for many things. It just would not be appropriate for <coughs> looking at the relative intensities of the different puncta here. All right, so here's the thing. These three images that I showed you, I can show these exact same three image, 
images and commit scientific fraud because of, the, of what I say about the image. Here, protein was pr only present in the cell body and punctate dendritic regions. Well, I can't tell any difference from the way I contrasted this image out, but I'm wrong because if you look at it, there's a lot of protein in all sorts of other places, okay? What if I said protein was distributed uniformly throughout the cytoplasm? Well, here I can't tell any different because I saturated it to where all the dendrites look the same, but the truth is it's not uniform. How about all puncta showed equal levels of protein localization? Well, here I saturated out all the puncta. I can't tell the difference between any of them. Okay, so the key is to show people to make what you're saying scientifically consistent with what you're showing in terms of the image. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the background. So here I said the protein was only present in the cell body and punctate dendritic regions. That was wrong. You guys know it was wrong. The reason you know it was wrong because you've also seen the image where you know that the protein is there throughout the dendrites, okay? The reason you know that is because you were able to, we were able to turn up the contrast there. What if we undersaturated the image to where all the background was just uniformly black? Then we could say something like this, right? It would be wrong, but nobody would know the wiser because they wouldn't be able to see the background of this image, okay? So it's incredibly important to think about, to always set the background to where you can see noise in the background throughout the images. A black background is not appropriate. And to set the maximum intensity in your image in a way that justifies the scientific statements that you're trying to make. All right, so let's talk about some real world examples. Um, I get to spend some of my fun time looking at Retraction Watch. It's a website where you can look at dumb mistakes people make um, in falsifying their data. Here's an example of a paper where um, you can see very nicely their control is missing a band here. Um, but if we turn up the contrast in this image, we can see, oh, they actually cut out the control band for the sample. The funny thing about this example is they actually contrasted this image with the background apparent. So they, you know, so they followed accepted practice and so we were able to discover that they had falsified this image, even though um, it wasn't appropriate. All right, so they were maybe not so smart about how they did their falsification. Um, here's another kind of interesting example. Um, this is a microscopy technique called FRAP. In FRAP, you bleach out all the signal in an image. Um, so you end up with a dark image. And then you look at the recovery of the signal. And the recovery of the signal can tell you things about diffusion throughout the sample or about protein production in the sample. Um, but if you look carefully at this image, this, you know, looks a little bit too nice to be a real scientific image. Microscopes don't take completely uniform images, and if we boost the contrast, we see it's not just uniform. Every single pixel in this image is identical to one another, okay? That is impossible on a microscope. Microscopes have noise. You should see noise in the background. Okay, and then this paper was subsequently retracted. Um, <laughs> it can go even worse. In this case, if you take this image, the first thing you notice is that this background is uniformly white, which we just said was a no-no. Okay, and then the other thing you notice is that there's sharp lines in between these bands. Now, it's possible that they just, these were two blots from two different gels, but it's accepted practice to show very clearly when you have separation between two different images in a sample. You should put a line there, okay? If we invert this image and boost the contrast, you can see it actually is much worse than that. Every single band in this gel is just pasted in from another image, which is completely and utterly inappropriate. Make it clear what your intentions are. Show the background, show very clearly with lines where gels and bands are separated. So um, the other thing that's important is sometimes appearance of fraud is an important thing too. Um, there's a technique called JPEG compression. JPEG compression is great. It reduces the size of your images dramatically. Here you can see this image went from 126 kilobytes down to four kilobytes, but it does so by setting pixels in your image equal to one another. And this makes your image, gives your image the appearance of blockiness. So I didn't paste in any bands here, but it kind of looks like I did. 
because I use JPEG compression. One alternative to JPEG compression to reduce the size of your images is something called LZW compression. It's a lossless compression. You don't get this blocky character to images, but you also don't save as much space in terms of the image. Okay. All right, but let's say you have to compress your images. They're just too big. You have to compress them. What can you do to combat accusations of fraud? Um, one solution is to save your raw data and raw data from the microscope in the proprietary format of the microscope manufacturer contains something called metadata. And metadata is information more than just the image that you collected that tells people what's going on in this image, okay? If I look at the metadata for this file, this was a ZVI file taken off of a Zeiss microscope, um, I can see the microscope name, I can see the type of objective I used, I can see the filter, I, filter cube I used, so if somebody accuses me of using the wrong filter, I can say this is exactly what I used. I can see what camera I used, exposure time, etc. So raw data and metadata is incredibly important to being able to combat accusations of fraud in image processing. And at Stowers, we've gone one step further. What we've done is we've created something called the Original Data Repository. When you publish a paper at Stowers, you're required to place your raw original data with the metadata in this repository and anybody in the world can go to our publications and they can see the raw data associated with those publications. It's just a level of transparency that allows people to see that um, we did things the right way. Um, I told you I was going to talk to you about gamma adjustment briefly. Gamma adjustment is when instead of mapping linearly between black and red in this image, we can emphasize intensity differences. So here, We've emphasized low, we've de-emphasized low intensity differences and overemphasized high intensity differences. And that allows us to kind of see the whole image in one contrast setting. This is great, but as you can see, it could mislead you in terms of what you think is happening in this image. And so you can do it, but you need to disclose it, preferably in the figure legend right with the figure itself. So everybody knows that this is a gamma adjusted image. Okay, let's talk about scaling a little bit. Um, scaling is an issue that people have a lot of trouble with, probably less of an issue in terms of fraud, um, but still something we need to talk about. Um, let's say in this image, we were really excited about this little punctum along one of the dendrites. We wanted to talk about its asymmetric localization. Well, if I show an image of it zoomed in, it looks really pixelated. And it looks really pixelated because we've gotten to the point where our pixels are big relative to the the screen resolution we have, okay? Now I can take a line profile across this and the line profile actually looks dramatically better. Why does it look so much better? And the reason is because of something called interpolation, okay? This is actually what we see in the image. We see this blocky character to the image, okay? And the reason this looks so much smoother is because we took the points of each pixel and we drew lines in between them, okay? Something called interpolation, okay? Um, scaling, by definition, introduces new pixels that weren't there before. So you have to decide where those new pixel values come from. In a normal scaling, those new pixels are just copies of the ones right next to them. In interpolation, now those pixels are linear interpolations between those data points that were there before. So there's different kinds of interpolation. There's none. This is always okay. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it's always appropriate. Um, there's another kind of interpolation called bilinear interpolation. Just like with the lines in between the points in the profile, we draw two-dimensional lines in between the pixels here. This is our recommended method of scaling an image. You have to disclose it in your materials and methods. There's another method of interpolation called bicubic interpolation. Bicubic interpolation is inappropriate. And this corresponds in a graph, like drawing smooth curved lines between the points. So let me explain a little bit more why we can't use bicubic interpolation. We have this simple image with a dot in the middle of it. We do bilinear interpolation. We end up, as we expect, with a triangle, right? We drew lines between the background and the image to generate our new pixels. We did bicubic interpolation. Now we introduce these weird valleys here, right next to the point that we're trying to resolve. And so this is why it's introducing new information, false information. This is why we don't use this in image processing.
So why not just take the data at higher resolution? Well, there's reasons for that. There's scientific, good scientific reasons for that. On a confocal microscope, if I take an image at four times higher resolution, it's going to take me 16 times longer to acquire that image at the same signal noise. Okay, so a 30 second stack acquisition now takes eight minutes. The cell I was looking at in my 30 second image might have crawled away by eight minutes later. Now there is signal. Not every sample scientifically will handle longer exposure. Okay. And we're trying to push the limits of scientific discovery here, so we can't always do that. If you reduce exposure or power by 16 fold, noise increases four times. So there's a major drawback to collecting images at higher resolution. The other thing that goes into this is optically, we can't resolve things on a normal microscope less than, 100, less than 200 nanometers anyway. So a pixel size less than 100 nanometers doesn't increase the amount of detail I see. It only makes the things bigger and noisier. So the bottom line is it's better to interpolate for higher resolution than it is to omit the result as a whole. Okay, so let's try putting together our figure in PowerPoint. We're gonna take our little punctum, we're gonna paste it into our PowerPoint, but wait, this looks just like our bicubic interpolation image. Reality is PowerPoint automatically interprets, interpolates images with bicubic interpolation. If you must put an image into PowerPoint, for publication, you need to pre-scale your images with the desired method and then paste into Illustrator. That's a pain. Why not try Photoshop? It must be better, right? It's professional software. Photoshop by default does the exact same thing that PowerPoint does. The difference in Photoshop is you can go into the preferences and you can pick, instead of by cubic interpolation, you can pick by linear interpolation. So at least you have the option. We prefer using Adobe Illustrator for figure layout. And that's because it's the only program that doesn't by default inappropriately process image. I should say the only popularly used program. There's some other ones out there that are less popular. Let's talk very briefly about DPI. DPI is dots per inch. This has nothing to do with the resolution you took the image on the microscope. This has to do with how you put the image on the screen. Most imaging programs use 72 DPI. Um, here's our little tiny images. Publishers want you to publish at 300 DPI. If I take our tiny images and I, our, our tiny image and I squish together the pixels so that they're 300 DPI, now my image looks like this. Well, that's fairly pointless. The solution is to scale it to double the expected size in something like Fiji or image J. Then when you scale it back down, in, um, in Illustrator, you'll have it at the right DPI, okay? You can also use something in Illustrator called Rasterize. Rasterize lets you set your image at the correct size, but just be careful because Rasterize may introduce some of the same artifacts that um, scaling of an image would, re would create otherwise. The other thing is don't use too high of a resolution. If you take a huge image and squash it down really tiny in Illustrator, your images will be incredibly large and you're gonna have a hard time publishing um, with that big of an image. Let's talk very briefly about vector versus raster graphics. So far I've been talking about images where images are a series of pixels with different intensity values. Vector graphics are something else. Vector graphics are basically mathematical descriptions of drawing. So if you have an E, the E is a description of how to draw an E. So when I create that E in Illustrator or on a PDF and I zoom in on it, it looks beautiful because the mathematical description of how to draw it just scaled up. It didn't change dramatically. If I make that E as a raster graphic, as an image, okay, now I just have individual pixel values. Now when I scale up that image, all these gaps between the pixels become apparent. And so it's important when you're doing text and when you're doing line drawings like figure, like graphs, you want to do that in something called vector graphics and you want to use the appropriate format for vector graphics and Adobe Illustrator supports that. Um, so I want to very briefly acknowledge some other people that helped me out with this. Sarah Smith is um, part of this effort and all the other talks are going to be from her. Um, Sue Jasperson, Jeff Lang and Heather Cartwright and Brian Slaughter all helped me find 
fun examples in Retraction Watch to show you. And um, I have to acknowledge the, the funding that I get from the Stowers Institute and from Jim and Virginia Stowers who were so incredibly generous with their support. Thank you very much.